Um, I'm the timekeeper, yep. so this is the 15 second. Yeah, 15 seconds left. I'll hold it up about three seconds. And this is the stop sign. Can everybody see those? Yep. Okay, great. The Wi-Fi was on um, Jay yes. And then the next word was guess what the other will be. And then where those letters were again. Okay. We are live on the Vimeo link. Guest S T J with G S T J capitals. Are we wearing masks during the? Um, if everyone is either vaccinated or has a negative test. And you're all comfortable with removing your masks while you're sitting there, that's okay with me, but I leave it to you to decide. If you would like to have a mask on, I think Mary you might want to take your if mask you would off. Like you're triple vaccinated or something. <laughs> have three shots. Sure. I'm still waiting on a booster, but if, if others are comfortable with it, I'm fine. I know. With whatever you all will do, I will keep my mask on unless I'm answering a question. I have two. I think that's what we do with a lot of a lot of sometimes we've had everybody just agree, you know. And do your mind if I Oh no, you go ahead. <laughs> okay. A few minutes, guys. I like that Anna has put on YouTube now afterwards. Mm -hmm. and then 
Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Go. All right. Hello and welcome to this candidate forum for candidates for Minneapolis Council in Ward 13. I'm Mary Santi, a longtime member of League of Women Voters White Bear Lake area, and I will be your moderator. This forum is being live streamed on the Minneapolis Facebook page, as well as uh, Vimeo. The unedited recording will be available for viewing on the Minneapolis Facebook page and also on the website. All of the candidates who filed to run for this office have uh, been invited to participate. Ward 13 is located in the southwest corner of the city. It has a mix of rental and owner-occupied homes with families, single people, and seniors. It has some of the city's most active parks and recreation areas, including West Makaska, Lake Harriet, Grass Lake, and Minnehaha Creek. The area also includes thriving neighborhood business districts with a mix of specialty shops, neighborhood stores, and restaurants. We like to thank our sponsors, the Linden Hills Neighborhood, uh, St. Luke and James Episcopal Church, several of the Ward 13 neighborhood associations, and St. John's Episcopal Church and a special thanks to St. John's for providing the venue for tonight, and Rex McKee for broadcasting and recording. League of Women Voters does not support or oppose any candidate or political party. We provide forums such as this to allow you, the voters, to hear what candidates think on the issues, and so you can come to your own conclusions about your your vote. The views expressed tonight are not those of the League of Women Voters or any of the sponsors, but they are of the candidates. And sponsorship of this forum does not mean an endorsement of any particular candidate by the League of Women Voters or the hosts. Minneapolis residents will be voting for the Office of Mayor, City Council, our board and board of estimate and taxation. And there are also three charter amendments. Minneapolis uses ranked choice voting for its elections. There is no primary. You have the power to rank candidates in the order of your preference on your ballot. As you listen to the candidates, consider not just your first choice, but your second and third choices as well. Just a reminder, election day is Tuesday, November 2nd, and early voting is in progress right now. Let me introduce the candidates who are here tonight. They drew numbers to ha uh, have their order of speaking, and they are Ken Solway, Mark Norton, and Linnea Palmasano. Our format will start with opening statements. They would each have two minutes for their opening statement and then a question period with one minute to respond to the questions. And finally, two minutes for closing statements. Our timekeeper, Judy, will show a 15 second warning time 
and then a stop sign. And at that time, you can finish your sentence. You do not need to stop in mid-word. Questions were received in advance, and we received many, many of them. But you can still submit questions through uh, Facebook chat. Any questions that are unclear, are hostile, or of a personal nature will not be used. And we will consolidate questions that fall in the same general topic area. All of the questions become the property of LWV Minneapolis. So let us begin with opening statements. Ken Salway, will you begin, please? Yes, thank you very much, Mary. My name is Ken Salway. Um, I live in Fulton neighborhood. I've been in Minneapolis for about five years now, and every year um, it seems to have gotten a little bit worse. Um, and the reason for me running for city council, I was very upset with the, the death of George Floyd, but even more upset with, or equally as upset with what transpired afterwards. And come to find out there has not been a Republican, which I am a registered Republican, on city council since the 90s. It's been like 30 years, which is crazy to me. I firmly believe in the two-party system. Um, you have to have two parties hold them accountable. There's no accountability right now, um, and that was my main purpose for running for city council. So thank you. Next, Mike Norton. Sure. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Um, thank you, Mary, for hosting. Thanks, uh, Ken and, and Councilmember Palmasano for joining, and uh, to the neighborhood organizations as well as uh, the church for uh, hosting this forum. But I, most of all, thank you to the Ward 13 voters uh, for taking time out of your Tuesday night to hear about the issues. Um, I'm Mike Norton. I live in the Lenhurst neighborhood where I've lived since 2014 with my wife and stepdaughter and our rescue dog, Maleficent J. Wilkington's. She goes by the Wolves for short. Um, I'm the founder of one of the 50 fastest growing companies in Minnesota, uh, and I'm on the autism spectrum, which has forced me to really try and understand where people are coming from uh, more than maybe uh, at least in the last few years since I've been diagnosed, more than I had in the past, and more than I normally would. Um, just like Ken kind of mentioned, uh, George Floyd's murder uh, really changed my perspective on Minneapolis and kind of where we're at as a city and, and where we should be headed. Um, and also changed my perspective on Ward 13. And why is it so different here um, than it is in other corners of the city? Why is, you know, the Ward with the three whitest neighborhoods in Minneapolis also the safest, also the most affluent? And where does that come from? And it's changed the way that I um, view where we should be headed and, and reshaped kind of my uh, uh, vision for the city. Um, I've been fortunate to meet a lot of like-minded neighbors that feel the same way. Um, I'm proud to be endorsed by the uh, founder, founding members of uh, AREA, or Armitage Reparations and Equity Action, and CORE, or Kenny Organizing for Racial Equity, uh, as well as a coalition of progressive neighbors that are, are pushing for change. Um, we have an historic, uh, we have, we're in an historic moment here, and I think we have an opportunity to really make um, significant reforms and significant adjustments for where we're headed as a city. And uh, to me, you, know, you look at things like having the biggest achievement gaps in the country, having uh, some of the biggest income gaps, and to where we should be headed, in my, my opinion, is towards equity, because an equitable city is a peaceful city. Thank you. Now, Linnea Palmasano. Thank you. Thank you to the League of Women Voters. Thank you to the seven neighborhoods of the 13th Ward that have helped to put this together and all of the work you've put into it. Um, to St. John's Church and the people here on their behalf, and also the candidates that have agreed to come and have this conversation tonight. I'm Lene Palmasano, and I'm running to continue my service to the city of Minneapolis through sitting on the 13th Ward um, council member position. Uh, you know, local government is really personal to me, to people that I care about, and I think to everybody. Um, local government, I think, has the opportunity to really create the best public good, uh, really has an opportunity to do things that help bring people together um, toward healing and reconciliation after difficult times. We've been through a lot these past couple of years. We have been through um, supporting our local businesses and one another through a global health pandemic. We've He'd, we've, we've welcomed um, and, and stood up with the worldwide call to transform our public safety system after George Floyd's murder. 
For 22 years, I've been fortunate to call Minneapolis our home. I'm raising a family here. I live in the Linden Hills neighborhood. Um, I believe that I'm the tested and trusted voice to lead our city forward. Uh, I work very hard at City Hall every day for you. I work in my community, even when it means at City Hall that sometimes I need to stand alone. I'm the DFL endorsed candidate in this race. I received over two thirds the delegate votes for that endorsement and the second highest sub caucus in the city. I look forward to delving into some of the issues and I look forward to it tonight. Thank you. And we'll turn to questions now and I'll, uh, I'll tell you which order that uh, we expect your responses in. And I remind candidates, you do not need to use your full time. If you uh, want, you can just say what you have to say and be done. And then we'll have time for more questions at the end. So we do have many questions. So the first question um, is, after this election, the city will face a tough transitional period, regardless of which charter amendments pass. Which of your experiences have prepared you to overcome these transitional cha challenges? Why are you the right leader for this moment? And we'll start with Lenny Palmasano. Thank you. Um, tough transitions, I think, are something that everybody in this room and listening um, has experienced these past couple of years uh, with a global health pandemic. Um, being one of the city leaders, being needing to weigh in on important things, whether they were restrictions of how we shut down um, some of our our local businesses, um, uh, our, our mask mandates, um, how we go about restructuring a city budget to keep it balanced through the end of the year, um, when we know that we're facing a serious shortfall in money over the last five months. I think that those are experiences that I've been through. Um, I, I, welcome, um, I, I welcome those challenges. I've seen everybody who works for our city in service to the public dramatically transition. And I know that we can to implement whatever uh, results of this, this ballot bring us. Thank you. Next up is uh, Ken Selway. <laughs> I would echo a little bit of what she said in terms of moving forward, it's gonna take a collaborative effort. Um, I have fostered a reputation for working with um, a team, as a team, it, in almost every aspect of life. It, it takes a team to get a lot of things done. I would use my experiences in the business world to, again, influence, persuade, be the, I don't want to say the voice of reason, just an opposing view from what's currently being done. I think we can all agree that it, the city is not going in the right direction or hasn't been as of late past two years. And in order to make it go into a different direction, we have to have different people in office. Um, so that's it. Thank you. And Mike Norton. Sure. Thanks. So, I mean, in terms of transitions, I think we're, we're already in that tough transition period. It'll just be kind of a continuation from what we've been dealing with for the last you know year and a half or, or two years now. Um, I, in terms of, of personal experience, I, I don't know that anybody, particularly what, what's taken place in the last year plus, is, is prepared for what's out there and, and has all the answers. Um, last year, we, uh, our company, won a, a Techni Award from Mintech, and we went up against uh, two nine-figure revenue companies, 50 times our size, uh, very, very big companies. Uh, but we were able to win in the supply chain category with our software and our technology. I think a big driver for that was, you know, on the team that built it was myself, my business partner, but we had three interns that were all uh, exchange students. Two of them were at McAllister, two of, one was at uh, St. Uh, Cloud. And that diversity of thought, I think, is what brought us to a point where we could make something better. And I think that recognizing that no one has all the knowledge, but being willing to uh, listen and being willing to uh, understand where other people are coming from, I think will be critical in the next few years. Thank you. And the next question, um, the Ken Solway will be the first, and then uh, Lene Palmasano, and finally Mark Norton. 
uh, and this regards uh, one of the charter amendments, and I will be reading the text of it. Shall the Minneapolis City Charter be amended to adopt a change in its form of government to an executive mayor legislative council structure to shift certain powers to the mayor, consolidating administrative authority over all operating departments under the mayor and eliminating the executive committee. And the question is, do you support this amendment? Yes or no, and why? I do support the amendment um, reasons for, I think our system is kind of outdated compared to other metro cities. And it's, it's very outdated when you think about it. And to have city council have, or the committee have power, it, it's just more, there needs to be someone in charge. You're like his hands are tied and so much stuff he wants to be done because he doesn't have all the power. So he needs to have the ability to do what people elect him to do. If he was elected to be the mayor, or whoever is elected to be the mayor, they should have the power to do what the people want or elect them to do. And, and that's why I, would, I do support. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, let me, Almasano. I also support question number one, the Charter Amendment on Government Structure. It's important to me that the Charter Commission went through an incredible amount of research to get to this proposal, and I don't think that the ballot language itself necessarily can go through all of the details of it, but in general, it's a really important modernization of our city structure. Um, I see this as um, it's, this is a good metaphor that has been shared with me that we're trying to run our modern government on a chassis from the 1800s and it clunks along in the best of times and when everybody can um, come together and get along and in, in really difficult times you see the fractures of it and it can't run at the speed of our modern needs. I also think that one important piece of this is, is looking at systemic racism in our city and I think we're all a little clear eyes more clear-eyed about that this past year. And we need to look in every corner of our city government. We need to look beyond the police department and look in the mirror. Thank you. And Mike Norton. Sure, thank you. And I, I think just to um, finish, or start off where uh, Councilor Obama was on up there, stop, I do think we need to look at this through a racial equity lens. And uh, Ward 13, as I mentioned before, three of the whitest neighborhoods in Min the three whitest neighborhoods, excuse me, in Minneapolis, the whitest ward in, in Minneapolis has produced two of the last three mayors uh, have come from Ward 13 city council uh, members. Uh, the other thing about Ward 13, Councilmember Ponsano alluded to in the caucuses, we had the highest voter turnout. We generally do uh, uh, in all instances, uh, but in the caucuses, in the general election, everything else, and sometimes two to three times that of uh, wards in North Minneapolis by taking away that representation and diluting those voices uh, and those city council members through a strong mayor amendment, um, you know, we're steering power towards Ward 13. Uh, and I don't think that that's necessarily an equitable thing to do. Uh, the other thing I would say is I'm just generally against consolidation of power. I think you need to have checks on power. You look at Trump, for instance, and having checks on Trump, you know, not saying that we have a Trumpian mayor yet, but there is that opportunity for that to happen and having some checks in place and some uh, decentralization of power is meaningful. Thank you. Uh, for this next question, uh, Mike Norton will begin, then uh, Linnea Lamasano, and finally Ken Solway. Uh, many believe the city council and mayor do not work together efficiently. Knowing that there could be many changes among city government leaders after this election, how would you work together with the mayor and the city council to avoid fragmentation and inefficiency? Sure, and I think that one of the biggest complaints that people have about uh, the city council and city hall in general right now is that nothing's getting done. You know, the pace of change is, is too slow uh, and there's a fair amount of, of uh, infighting at, at times and the mayor has not been necessarily productive in some of those conversations. Uh, but at the end of the day, you have to work with who's there. Uh, there's no there's no opportunity to say, well, I don't like this person, I don't like the mayor, I don't like the uh, city council member from this ward, I'm not gonna work with them. Um, you know, I think the first thing that I would do uh, when I became a city council member would be to meet one-on-one -on -one with each of the other city council members, uh, and, and as well as the mayor, and just try and understand where they're coming from. Uh, even if it's a different place than me, even if their perspectives are, are different than mine and their priorities are different than mine, 
Uh, I think just understanding that and knowing where people are coming from is critical. Um, and, and that would be the first thing I would do is just, you know, what, what's important to you, new mayor Kate Knuth or new mayor Sheila Nazad, uh, and going from there. Thank you. Lene Palmasano. How do you avoid fragmentation in City Hall? Well, given it's an election year, I get to work and enthusiastically support candidates and work electorally um, toward what I think is a coalition of people that are really serious about government. It doesn't mean that I agree with them on anything, on everything, uh, but it does mean that I want to be able to stay in conversation with somebody. I think that is how I've approached conflict in the past. I can very respectfully disagree without it seeming like I am burning your proverbial house down. Uh, I, I look to try and get people to see my point and to reconcile and to see how we move forward together. Um, I think that every one of my major legislative initiatives, whether it's wage theft um, or freelance worker ordinances, uh, it has been important to me to really reach across the city and find somebody who represents an area um, with people majority um, of color or, or cultural communities in our city that also wants that piece of legislation with me as a co -op. Thank you. Ken Selway. It has to be done through, again, it's a team effort, a team effort's gonna get it done. I would echo the same thing she said, you know, we can disagree and still be friends. That's, what, that's part of life. Um, but being elected, it's the constituents' voices who I want to represent and have those get out there and not and make sure that it's not an agenda by someone who's been elected or who's in office and they're pushing their own agenda as opposed to the constituents. And that's how I would do it. It would be, this is what the people want, so this is what we want to give them. It's not about what an individual who's already in office or who would be elected to office, what they want. It's about people. Thank you. And we'll go to the next question then. And it'll begin with Ken Solway. We'll go to uh, Mike Norton next and Lene Palmasano third. How would you plan on connecting with all community members, whether they share your perspective or not, to build trust, get input, and give updates on your work? How would you be accountable and your work transparent? So you have to be involved in all the communities, um, all the different things that go on, whether it's farmer's market or t-ball games or hockey games. It's, you have to, you have to be out there, obviously get noticed. You have to communicate well. Transparency, transparency is a big word for me because I'm so big on transparency, whether whether you like it or not, you know, it, you have to just be transparent and and you can disagree, of course, but transparency is huge. You have to, I mean, they do a good job now in City Hall. They do email, probably emails every week that I get um, from all the councilmen. So there's certain ways you can communicate with the public in order to get your point across or your views across. And also you need to have an open uh, uh, with the public as well, so you know what they want and what it is that you can do for them as well. Thank you, um, Mike Norton. Sure. So, and I think um, you know it, we've got uh, uh, at least two candidates, and probably all five candidates that are in our team that have very different views of where the city should be going. Uh, and uh, depending on how the election shakes out, I think there's going to be at least some plurality of, of neighbors that are frustrated. Uh, and I think it's um, it's important to go meet those people where they're at, understand why they're frustrated, understand uh, what what the disappointment is, and what candidate. Uh, but in terms of of um, you know, it, like uh, candidate said, and, and uh, Councilmember Palmasano said a few moments ago, I think it's important to be able to disagree without being dis being disagreeable. Um, and uh, for me, uh, that's I think one of the benefits uh, of being on the spectrum uh, is. I'm totally fine having what would normally be very uncomfortable conversations uh, with people uh, and not taking it personally and not letting it go to a point or a place of anger or anxiety, uh, other than my general awkwardness and anxiety and conversation as it is. But um, I, I would say it's, you know, it's important to uh, understand where people are coming from and uh, not be afraid to go out there and have those uncomfortable conversations. Thank you. Lene Palmasan. 
Tomasano. Thank you. It's a challenge to try and be everywhere at once, you know, and I, I just represent one thirteenth of our city. So um, whether it's trying to be at every neighborhood meeting I can be, um, every place where people are gathering for different uh, under different circumstances for different needs, um, hosting ward forums or meeting everybody, whether it's across the city for coffee because they want to speak with me or, um, or, or or, you know, there's a reason my both my boys don't like going with me to the grocery store because you run into people and they have needs and they want to be heard. Um, but here's how I make decisions. First and foremost, I think it's really important to listen to the experts and to share what experts might have to say about a particular direction you might be going. Second, it is really important to listen to the public and particularly those that are the deepest impacted and the people that have been deeply left out of our conversations at City Hall over time are our BIPOC community members. We need to make decisions then with all of that information, with great transparency Thank and communicate. Thank you. And we come to the second charter amendment, which I will read, and I will also read the explanatory note. Shall the Minneapolis City Charter be amended to remove the police department and replace it with a Department of Public Safety that employs a comprehensive public health approach to the delivery of functions by the Department of Public Safety with those specific functions to be de determined by the mayor and city council by ordinance which will not be subject to exclusive mayoral power over its establishment, maintenance, and command, and which could include licensed peace officers, police officers, if necessary, to fulfill its responsibilities for public safety, with the general nature of the amendments being briefly indicated in the explanatory note, uh, which is made a part of this ballot. And the explanatory note says, this amendment would create a Department of Public Safety combining public safety functions through a comprehensive public health approach to be determined by the mayor and council. The department would be led by a commissioner nominated by the mayor and appointed by the council. The police department and its chief would be removed from the city charter. The Public Safety Department could include peace police officers, but the minimum funding requirement would be eliminated. And the question is, do you support this a proposal? Yes or no, and why? And we will hear first from Lene Palmasano, then Ken Sawe, then Mike Norton. Local government, one of the most important things we provide or not is public safety. I've known since my first run for office in 2013 that that means different things to different Local people. Government, government, the most important thing. But it does um, mean that every person, no matter what neighborhood they live in, should feel safe in their community and feel safe with their children playing outside. Um, I have never once heard someone say in dozens of hours of public safety committee testimony, which I've worked hard to be on now for seven years. Nobody has ever said, if only the city council controlled the police department, everything would be better, or that anything would be better. That kind of change would not remove the barriers to uh, qualified immunity, to mandatory arbitration, to all of those things that stand in our way. This was a valid petition and it needs to be on the ballot. It's not the first time this kind of initiative has come before me. I think that systemic problems require systemic thinking. And I don't think this will start us down that path to that question. My answer on this is no, and I encourage others to also say no to this question. Thank you. Ken Solway. My answer is also no um, on this uh, question. There's a couple things that, to if there's a situation, you never address the solution. You want to address the problem. And, and the police department, they might not be the solution, but they are definitely not the problem um, of, of what's happening here in Minneapolis. So the, the, it's been tried and tested, the method that, that's in place now. There's nothing that I've heard of that they can put forward that has 
worked or that has they've used in other areas of the country and other metro cities and it's worked and they're just shooting blindly and it's just not it doesn't it's not a good way to go you know public safety is a, it's a prerequisite to uh prosperity and it is vital that you vote for no that's my stance on this no thank you mike norton sure uh you know i, I think like a lot of people that are, or really like everyone in the city over the last year, year and a half, you know, and throughout the country, we've all been dealing with a, a crime spike. Um, and I think it's it, 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 not a conversation that maybe a lot of us in Southwest Minneapolis expected to be having, um, you know, telling our kids or telling, you know, I've had conversations with my wife and my spouse about being aware of your surroundings when you're bringing in groceries or from the alley and things like that. Um, and it's a different experience maybe than we're used to, but it's not an uncommon experience uh, in other parts of the city. And we've actually seen, even in Southwest with the spike we've seen, it hasn't been uh, to the levels that it already was in pre-pandemic levels in some parts of the city. Uh, so the status quo, I think, wasn't working. And I think it's important to step back and, and take a look at that and say, you know, we need to change and we need to reevaluate what we're doing. Uh, talk about this for 20 30 minutes but i think the most important thing to, to really acknowledge is that this is something that was fought for hard by the police federation it's a point where uh, council member Palmasano, the mayor and, the, and uh, uh, bob kroll are all aligned is in their support of this amendment and I, i'm strongly encouraging you to vote yes on question two thank you and for the next question um mike norton will go first then lene Palmasano and ken solway what is your vision for public safety in Minneapolis and Ward 13 specifically? What actionable steps can be taken to get us there? Sure, and I think it's important maybe to talk about um, what, in terms of the Department of Public Safety, what the opportunities would be. Uh, for me, that doesn't mean getting rid of any officers. It wouldn't mean reducing the force in any capacity. And what it really is, is expanding who we can hire in those vacant positions. Right now we're down about a third uh, uh, from early retirements, um, uh, uh, other issues, uh, uh, and uh, uh, quite frankly, some pullback. And uh, in terms of replacing those roles, we do need more officers, but I would like to see some of the workload that's on officers right now, running from call to call and unable to really focus on violent property crime. If we could bring in uh, unarmed responders for things like mental health calls, for traffic control, uh, for uh, taking police reports after a crime has taken place like a burglary where you don't need armed response. Uh, I think those are areas where we can lift workload off of our officers and help them focus on violent and property crime where, you know, we have uh, sort of an abysmal uh, clearance rate. Uh, I think uh, our murder clearance rate, our homicide clearance rate is around 44% compared to 77% across the river in St. Paul. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, Ken Solway. So, you know, he, he mentioned mental health and traffic as a uh, don't need armed officers to go there. Now, there, we all know there's been instances before where cops have pulled over a traffic incident and it has turned into a violent offense. Same with mental health. You know, I agree. It, maybe there was both, you know, a mental health person and a cop there just in case it escalated. But to say that to not have a police officer there to protect other people in the area it, it's a recipe for disaster now. I I would purposely I would propose an increase in a budget um, because I kind of feel like you get what you pay for, you know. So you have to have better quality police officers, better training, better equipment. You shouldn't have the ability to turn off and on their cameras. You know, if they're if they're on the clock, their, their cameras with audio and video should be rolling nonstop. That way, they can be held accountable for their actions. That's that's probably the number one way to get past they have to be accountable again accountability is huge um and that's my stance thank you and we'll go to the next question which is also on uh sorry oh. yes, oh, yeah, you skipped right. her yeah she was her <laughs> second <laughs> yeah all right um my vision for public safety is deeply rooted in my progressive and pragmatic values and it's a both and approach we need both law enforcement in our city and we need safety beyond policing. Um, that safety beyond policing, that investment in violence prevention, those are long-term investments and we need to give them time to work. We need to help figure out what we can do at a local government level to help meet people's basic needs so that violence and becoming a victim of violence is not part 
of their, um, it, their lived experience here in our city. We need more community-minded officers. And I do believe we need to increase the number of officers that we have today. We need significant reform. We also need new ways to respond to calls for help. We are working on that. We are already doing some of that work with both 311 report only calls and mental health responder only um, responders that are in development. But we also need these co-responder models because they can respond to more types of calls that are unknown when unknown trouble and other things that come into our system that we're not sure what kind of help might they need it. Thank you. And on this next question, we'll start with you, so we'll be sure not to forget you. <laughs> and then we'll be Mike Norton and Ken Solway. Uh, regardless of your stance on the public safety amendment, how do you think policing in Minnesota, Minneapolis can best be reformed? Please include policies that address police recruiting, police culture, police accountability, and police contract. What plans do you have? Okay, that was kind of a loaded question and we've got to answer it in 90 seconds. So, um, Submitted by a resident. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will share that I've been very interested, concerned, and involved in policing and police reform since I came onto city council seven years ago. It's part of why I'm the first, I think, 13th Ward Council member that sits on that specific committee. Um, my first term was really focused on transparency and accountability. And one of the important outcomes of my first term in office was an audit and asking hard questions like I often do through audit uh, of our police department and of body cameras. We went from 55% policy compliance with body cameras to the most recent was 95% compliance with body cameras. I think that what you can measure, you can manage, and we need to be able to do more of that across our police department. My second term has really focused on the culture of policing and how we recruit the right officers and create the kind of environment that will help keep us all safe. Thank you. Mike Norton. Thank you. And uh, just maybe to touch on a few things that Councilmember Palmasano said uh, and has been brought up by Ken also, I think accountability is critical. Um, it, you know, we, we talk about uh, camera usage compliance going from 55% to 95%. That's great, but we don't have audits of those cameras. We don't have regular routine uh, checks on what's taking place on those cameras on a daily basis. And uh, we saw a couple of weeks ago, it takes a court case with Jalil Stallings to actually see what's happening in some cases. So. I would like to see more transparency, more accountability on those uh, cameras, and more uh, more of a regular uh, audit process, including all five precincts in that. Um, in terms of steps in the right direction, I think the Office of Violence Prevention is a meaningful thing that we should put more funding towards. I was uh, frustrated uh, that Councilmember Palmasano voted against the creation of the Office of Violence Prevention when it started. Um, this is another topic, uh, like we could, like we said, we could talk about for a long period of time. But uh, I'll try and just sum up my points. Uh, Quickly, uh, I guess the last thing I would say is I'd like to see community-based police officers uh, that are living in or near the communities that they're actually uh, patrolling. Thank you. Ben Solway. So police reform, and, and it starts with getting the bad ones out, first and foremost. Um, there are probably still a few left on the force right now. Um, get rid of them, of course, hiring new, better trained officers whether they're in the community or not, I, I agree they should come from the community, but if the community doesn't provide that, then they can come from wherever, honestly, as long as the, the numbers are there to protect the community. That's the most important thing, is, is the public safety. So the culture as well, um, you know, the chief I'm a big fan of, I think he should stay. Um, he's done a great job in my view, so I would keep him on. And then again, the accountability part, it all comes back to 55% now, 95%. I feel as if if you're a public servant, then you, you should have no problem, you know, being your conversations anybody should have access to when you're on the clock. It's the same with teachers. Put a camera in every room, school room across the the city, just so parents can see. We want to, you know, our tax dollars are paying their bills, we're paying their. Thank you. Thank you. And we will go to the next question. Um, and they will be uh, first Ken Solway, Mike Norton, Lene Pomasano. 
Is the minimum funding requirement for police officers important to keep or eliminate from the city charter? Why or why not? Is that it? Oh, it's definitely important. I mean, if there's yes. no if there's no minimum budget, then they will continue to take away the amount of money that goes towards the public safety. And then it's the the minimum amount is just a, exactly that. It's a minimum. I mean, it should never be the minimum. It should always be more than that. But you've got to have a minimum. You have to have a bar set somewhere. If there's no bar set, then, then what are you shooting for? You know, you have to have a bar set. There needs to be a minimum, and it, it would be crazy to get rid of the minimum amount of funding for public safety, police department, whichever, or both. Thank you. Mike Norton? Sure. Uh, you know, I think it's important to understand where that uh, charter uh, requirement came from. And it was the police federation in 1961 that advocated for that minimum staffing requirement based on population. And it gives the federation tremendous leverage in uh, contract negotiations. Uh, the mayor and the mediator have been uh, negotiating or allegedly negotiating for the last year and a half, two years now, a contract that expired six months prior to George Floyd's being murdered by a Minneapolis police officer. So when we talk about what that minimum staffing requirement really is about, it's leverage for the police federation and leverage for the police union to uh, push in contract negotiations as well as uh, just having that, that base in play for uh, for their budget. And I think that even the mayor, uh, who has been maybe off on this topic several times, has supported getting rid of that minimum staffing requirement. I think it would give a lot of leverage to the city and maybe some more balance to, to that uh, police federation uh, negotiation. Thank you. Lene Palmasano. I'm not wed to having the minimum number of officers be in our city charter. Um, I understand it makes some people nervous both sides of that debate but i in all of my time at city hall never thought we would run afoul of this very low number that's in our city charter per population um, to the benefit of that that's not how we should do staffing is based on putting hard numbers into law um, also i think that it says it's the number of employees not the number of officers in our department one really important way i think to transform our department is to re-civilianize some positions that were um, uncivilianized in the past um, and you know part of the my understanding of the minimum number of officers is the other piece that's in that charter which is um, the funding mechanism it was a funding mechanism such that if we had a very um a, a very reticent state legislature that we could go above a levy limit if needed to be able to fund our own police department. So thank you. Thank you. And we have a question uh, we got on Facebook just while people were watching. And this will start with Lene Palmasano, go to Mike Norton and then Ken Salway. If elected, would you support expanding the Office of Violence Prevention to provide services to all victims and survivors of gun violence? I appreciate this question coming in online because it gives me an opportunity to correct the record and something that Mike Norton says about me a lot, which is I did not vote to create the Office of Violence Prevention. That's not true. I did vote to create the Office of Violence Prevention what I did vote against and what I suspect is conflating it with is I refused to at first fund it with the money that was supposed to hire sexual assault investigators, which is desperately needed in our city. Um, I believe deeply in a both and approach. I think the Office of Violence Prevention could be expanded. It could go into some other department if needed, uh, but it absolutely needs to have performance metrics and goals and it has been slow in getting started because there is so much work in it to do. We have good leadership in it. We need to expand it. And I'm committed to that. Thank you. Ken Soloway. I, I am for it. Um, it's important that anything that violence, violence prevention, I'm, uh, I'm for. It's important, especially gun violence. You know, if you're a victim of gun violence, it's a long road to get back if you can get back to where you were before so any 
group or funding for that, I, I obviously support that. Um, and with them would do so, yes. Mike Norton. Sure. No, I absolutely support uh, the Office of Violence Prevention. Uh, I think that it's a, an opportunity to uh, get in the way uh, when the cycle of violence starts. I think in a lot of cases, and we've seen this proven out over time, not just in Minneapolis, but all over the country, where uh, it's a cycle of violence for its response. It's uh, someone that knows someone and um, things spiral and they start to accelerate and escalate and getting in the way of that uh, and having a team of professionals that are solely tasked with, with interrupting violence and preventing violence, uh, obviously beyond the scope of what I just described, I think is critical. Um, I, I do think it's a little bit of semantics though to uh, maybe say that you're supportive of something and, and also vote against funding it. I understand it's complex at City Hall, but um, the reality is if, if you're supportive of something, you need to figure out a way to make it happen and get it done. Thank you. Then we have the third charter amendment. Shall the Minneapolis City Charter be amended to authorize the City Council to regulate rents on private residential property in the City of Minneapolis? This amendment would, one, authorize the City Council to regulate rents on private residential property in the City of Minneapolis by ordinance. Two, provide that an ordinance regulating rents on private residential property could be enacted in two different and independent ways. A, the city council may enact the ordinance. B, the city council may refer the ordinance as a ballot question to be decided by voters for approval at an election. If more than half of the votes cast on the ballot question are in favor of its adoption, the ordinance would take effect 30 days after the election or at such other time as provided in the ordinance. And the question is, do you support this amendment? Yes or no, and why? And we will start with Ken Solway, go to Lene Palmasano, and then Mike Norton. So in terms of support, the answer is no. I do not support anything that gives more power to city council over personal property. I mean, if you own a building or a, a dwelling, you shouldn't be told by city council or by anybody, honestly, what you want to charge to, for rent there. If if someone doesn't want to pay, obviously they have the option to look elsewhere for something. But to have somebody else tell you what you can charge somebody else for property that you own, it's preposterous to me. And it's just not, it's just not the way that, that I view things for sure. So I, it's a hard no for me. Thank you, Lene I do not support this ballot measure, but I do support the idea of rent stabilization. In fact, at just the last council meeting, we made some important uh, motion forward on renter protections in our city. I cannot support this ballot measure first and foremost because it's not lawful. Uh, our charter commission came back with a very robust report that said if you want rent stabilization in our city, it needs to be a two-step process because we don't currently today have that enabled in our city charter. So first, the voters would need to vote to develop rent stabilization measures. And then second, they deserve to know the details before it's enacted. That's not what this ballot measure has on it. In a way, St. Paul's um, ballot measure is better because St. Paul voters have the details in front of them. Uh, our city attorney's office later weighed in on the charter commission decisions and agreed that it's not lawful. So I cannot, as your council member, feel that it's right to put such a thing on the ballot and I won't be voting for it because we need tools that complement each other to forward our goals of affordable housing in our city. Thank you. Mike Norton. Sure. Uh, I do support uh, ballot question three and, and the, the opportunity to have a conversation about rent stabilization. Um, it, it, like Councilmember Palmasano said, it, it does conflict with state law a little bit, and I do think that we'll have to use the latter of the two explanations that you brought up, Mary, uh, in terms of bringing whatever decision is made to a vote or to a ballot initiative later. Um, so that would be the only way I would support any sort of form of rent stabilization coming into uh, policy would be if it first went to the voters uh, for them to decide. Uh, I do support rent stabilization. I think it's important to understand who is actually renting uh, apartments and homes in the Twin Cities or in Minneapolis, really. 
Uh, over 80% of the rental units in Minneapolis are owned by about a dozen companies. These are large corporations, many of them based outside the state, most of them based outside Minneapolis. And we're really talking about limiting uh, rent increases for existing uh, tenants and uh, existing renters and putting a cap on that so that we have neighborhood stability. Um, I would be supportive of a high single digit uh, annual re uh, rent stabilization cap. And really what I'm focused on is preventing price gouging and making sure that people stay in the communities where they live. Thank you. For this next question, we'll start with Lene Palmasano, Mike Norton, and then Ken Selway. How would you ensure that a rent stabilization proposal does not impose an undue burden on responsible rental property owners? I'm first, right? I'm first. Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, I think we need to be in conversation with them. Um, I, like I said, the way I make decisions is to research what the experts and academics and other people seen as experts have to say how this experience has gone in other cities. Has it produced more or less affordable housing? Um, and, it, and to work with some of our locally owned landlords to see what is it that they can support? I have had conversations with developers even that say, look, council member, rent stabilization could work in our city. I do think that we could have a conversation about that, but I do think the way that we would move forward on it would absolutely need to be brought to a vote with those details and that construct of who makes the decisions on how we adjust it over time to eliminate the negative um, consequences that might come from such legislation. Thank you. Mike Norton. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I, I have a, a fourplex apartment uh, behind our house, uh, and I, I know that there's a lot of anxiety in uh, War 13 and Southwest Minneapolis about renters and about apartments, but I think it's been great. And to me, what I would like to see is those neighbors staying in place and having the opportunity to not be pushed out of a neighborhood with great schools, with lower crime than the rest of Minneapolis, uh, and have some stability in their housing. Uh, you know, I think the way that we make this work with landlords is to put a threshold in place so that small, even to medium-sized landlords, maybe a thousand units, uh, would maybe not have the same requirements as uh, large landlords that, like I said, take up four out of every five uh, rental units in the city. Um, it, this is, again, a topic we could talk about all day, and it's unfortunate we, we have such time restrictions, uh, but I would just finish it up with saying that uh, if we can leave room for profitability of the landlords, uh, improvement of, of the existing rental units, and still give space for that tenant to stay in place with a high single-digit cap on uh, rent stabilization. Thank you. Ken Solway. So I think it's, I think it's naive to think that rent would never go up on, on a property you know taxes go up the owner has to pay higher taxes those get passed along down the line to everybody i mean it, look at right now you go to the grocery store bacon for example ridiculously priced 12 bucks almost for bacon nuts it's the same thing with housing it, it, the prices didn't go up property taxes go up value goes up you have to pass those prices down to the, to the renters to consumers now i agree communication is huge to solve any issue there is i mean you have to have open communication um, and that's something that I would push for is to have the open communication with them with the people. Um, you can accomplish anything as long as uh, you communicate well. It's always been a, you know, something that I believe in. So I would echo what she said, communication. But to think that the price should be the same, it's just, that's not sane, honestly. Thank you. And we'll turn away from the charter amendments uh, to some other questions. And this question will go first to Ken Solway, then uh, Mike Norton, Lene Palmasano. Please uh, provide specific examples for what you have done and or plan to do to increase mental health access for all. Include how you would support Hennepin County and other mental health 9-11 calls. So being, I think being a, a good elected official is knowing when 
knowing your strong points, knowing what your weak points, and knowing when you need to work or ask for help. And, and in terms of mental health, I don't have much experience with that. I would lean more on the team, because it's a team effort, the other members of council, to really uh, guide me or educate me before making or being able to answer that question. Thank you. Mike Nor. Yeah, so in, in terms of mental health, uh, you mentioned uh, 911. I, I think one of the first things we need to do is, is uh, change what 911 is and what type of response you get when you call 911, or if you want, calling 311. Excuse me, <clears throat> 311. Uh, I think there's a number of instances, and I know this was alluded to earlier, uh, where someone just needs uh, someone to get out there and have a response. Uh, you know, someone having a mental health breakdown or uh, some sort of a panic attack or something like that in a public setting. They don't need a, an armed response to come and uh, ex exacerbate the situation and turn it into something maybe that's more chaotic or more potentially violent. Um, I would like to see an expansion of the mental health responders team. I was really disheartened uh, to see that uh, the Minneapolis Police Department hadn't started the background checks for that team, even though they initially said they would and then apparently dragged their feet. It seems like it's uh, clumsily moving along. And, and uh, to me, this is something that's critically important and something that we should be accelerating the, the process on and not dragging our feet. Thank you. Lene Palmasano. I was a big supporter um, and helped with the pilot of uh, our mental health co-responder model that brought uh, a member from our county COPE team and an officer together on mental health kinds of calls. Those That pilot program had amazing results of being able to stabilize someone in place and of needing to take, I think, just one or maybe two people in out of their own situation or their own home and into a mental health hole. Uh, we need more of that. That is the way that we would hopefully partner with schools when schools need to call police, which is part of why that pilot was developed under the hours that it was, was to help meet the needs of a school day. Uh, I also think strongly that we need to partner with COPE you know, maybe before my colleagues uh, decided to create all their own infrastructure on a go it alone model, we could have had conversations with our county partner, um, with their union representation to see if they were willing to partner in such a pilot program. I also think we need training in our police department on crisis intervention. Okay, for the next question, we will start with Mike Norton. Go to Ken Salway, then Lene Palmasano. Minneapolis 2040 is a comprehensive plan that shapes how the city will grow and change. The plan covers topics such as housing, job access, the design of new buildings, and how we use our streets. What are your thoughts on the plan in its current state? Are there specific parts of the plan that you would champion? Are there parts you would wish to amend? Sure. Uh, so uh, the 2040 plan, I, I think, is something that uh, has brought a lot of frustration to Southwest Minneapolis. And I think there's been a fair amount of misinformation or, or lack of information for residents. Um, and and uh, that's disappointing because I think we have two opportunities with the 2040 plan. The first is more housing. Uh, and better neighborhoods, better structure uh, for, for people to find a home because we'll have more supply. The second opportunity is really about the environment and um, density, fewer trips, uh, not having to go as far for things like errands, groceries, and so on, um, uh, community schools, but being closer to, or having the opportunity to be walkable, bikeable, take fewer trips, uh, I think that that's a critical component of the 2040 plan. Reality is 2040 plan is not perfect. I uh, only have 15 seconds, so I can't get into all of the reasons why not. Uh, but I do think that it's something that we should work together. Uh, it, like Councilmember Palmasano said, even though she was the lone no vote against the 2040 plan, she does support the concepts behind it. And I think that we should work to uh, push for density, push for more housing opportunities uh, without uh, disrupting the neighborhoods that we have in place Thank already. You. Thank you. Ken Solomon. I, I agree um, that there's issues with the 2040 plan, but there's issues with, with almost everything. I think they need to be addressed. They can easily be addressed um, and come up with a plan to work those things out. Um, I do agree that there should be more housing. There should be more grocery stores, businesses brought, brought into it as well to 
determine, you know, their 50th in France is a booming area right there. So they're now putting, they just a month or two ago to put uh, apartments on top of the, the old cupcake place that's right there. So that's just an example. Um, they're building up and not out. Um, it's just an example of certain things that can be done. Thank you, Lene. Almost done. I did support the goals of the 2040 plan, uh, but was not able to accept to support the plan. I also made a lot of modifications to that plan to make it better, and I will continue to as we move forward and implement this plan over time, work to make sure that it meets those goals. One of those goals is affordable housing. Um, is the land use proposal above sweet retreat creating more affordable housing in our community? It's not. Uh, it was important to me that one of the amendments was how we would track this over time, because I think it will allow us to adjust and reduce the negative impacts of gentrification on neighborhoods. Um, I think that one of the things that um, we learned through the 2040 plan that the public became very aware of is that um, there it is very hard to see in City Hall who's making decisions and when. And when the public feels duped about how those decisions are made and what their role in participating is in it, uh, then that's not a good way to create policy. That's part of why I support charter question. Thank you. Ken Shalwe. I think Ken already. Yeah, we already. Oh, okay. I beg your pardon. Well, then we'll go to the next question. And um, we'll start. Did I'll go did again. Everyone, did everyone answer? Okay. Everyone did, yes. The next question will go first to um, Lene, Lene Pomisano, then to Ken Salway, and then to Mike Norton. What are your goals regarding the homeless population in Minneapolis, and what plans do you have to achieve them? And I'm first? Yes. Uh, our homeless population um, in the unhoused is a really difficult and challenging um, need in our city, um, in our region, right? In part, we have more homelessness in our city because we don't have other kinds of options for people to live where they are in other places around our state. Um, but my goals for addressing homelessness and getting people from homeless to housed um, is really about trying to increase the velocity with which they can go from um, a, a, a situation like a shelter that has supports around it into some type of very low income housing or some type of stability. One of my favorite projects that the city has helped to fund are the Avivo tiny homes. And part of this was pandemic response, but part of this is a new and really important response to homelessness, which is you have your own space and you have your belongings under lock and key and you can start to stabilize the rest of your life from it. Thank you. Ken, so so there's, there's a portion of the homelessness that want to be homeless and, and don't want to adhere to certain rules or whatnot. So, you know, to address it, there needs to be, they, there can't be encampments on public parks. That's for sure, because the taxpayers pay for that to keep them clean, keep them safe, and then to have encampments just pop up in it, that have violence and drugs and, and things going on there that, that people don't want their family members or kids around. There needs to be, you know, the hotel that they bought or they were putting the homeless in for a little while, I thought it was kind of a good idea. I think I would like to see that expanded a little bit. Um, but again, there's a lot more that goes into it, you know, the drug testing first and foremost, you know, uh, do they, they trash the place though, is, is, is what I heard. Um, so there, there needs to be rules in place to keep that from happening. But something along the lines of, of buildings, instead of letting buildings burn down during the riots, how about you take those same buildings and make them for the homeless, you know, let them live there. So there's gotta be, there's buildings here that are getting no use out of. So let's try to use some of those along those lines, like you did with the hotel to house the homelessness. Thank you, Mike Norton. So I, I think it's important to, to kind of step back and acknowledge that a lot of the people living in, in, in encampments, um, th there are maybe shelter opportunities for, but they're not uh, comfortable with the restrictions or requirements to be in those shelters. And I think that taking shelters as a launching pad uh, for 
moving uh, houseless to house uh, misses a big portion of the, the population that are, that are living in encampments right now. Um, I think we need to have a little bit more humanity. I, I was extremely disappointed to see the mayor essentially coming in with bulldozers uh, and multiple encampments over the past few months uh, when there's really not anywhere for a lot of these neighbors to go. Um, I think the reality is that in a lot of these shelters, there's a requirement to be uh, clean, so to speak, to not have a substance abuse issue or, or any other issues. And I think the reality is it's a lot easier to get clean if you have a stable roof over your head. And I would support an expansion of uh, what Councilmember Palmasama talked about with the Vivo project um, in SROs. I think that those shouldn't be limited to just nonprofits. I think we should have those all over the city and in places where uh, there's a, a lot of neighbors who maybe don't have enough money to rent an apartment, but would be able to lock up their things, have a safe place to sleep, and have a home. Thank you. Uh, next question, we'll go first to Ken Salwe, then Lene Palmasano, and Mike Norton. What will you do as a Ward 13 council person to use the power and economic security of Ward 13 residents? to impact the lives of Minneapolis residents who are marginalized. Hmm, marginalized. So, I mean, of all the wards, is this one, is this one the most marginalized? I don't know if that's accurate, to be honest with you. I don't know. I think they're saying the Ward 13 residents have the power and economic security. Oh, okay. What will you do to, to ensure that stays marginalized? Well, I mean, I think the, the residents of the 13th Ward have, have, over their lifetime, earned that. And it's it's earnable to other people as well. I don't want to take it away from them, to be honest with you. I don't think that's the right way to go about it. Or to marginalize it, to use your word, marginalize it. Didn't they ask their I know, question? I know. <laughs> That's it. That's okay, my answer. Yeah. Thank you. Lene Palmasano. I would offer back that a lot of my inspiration comes from so many residents of the 13th Ward that do that are the do-gooders of our community. Um, you know, um, I had an opportunity a couple weeks ago to be at someone's home who used her dental practice to then go in and provide dental services for all of the kids at Jefferson Elementary School, all of the free and reduced lunch kids. Um, her mission was to, for them to be free of dental disease. And that has expanded um, into really important ways into other schools and into other communities. So even if it's a conversation to help lift up some of the great things, some of the great entrepreneurs of our community, trying to figure out how we reduce waste in our system with like green to go packaging, um, I think there's a way to really be a character of all the important work being done. We pay for a big city vision, and I think the people of the 13th Ward believe in a big city vision. It's really important to them and me that every action we do as a city council has a race equity impact analysis attached. Thank you. Mike Norton. Sure. I, I think it's important to recognize the history of Ward 13. Uh, my, my home was built in the 1920s. Uh, at that time, uh, actually, the, the homes that were built just to the south of my home in the Armitage neighborhood uh, and Kenny had literally had racial covenants in the 1950s uh, and beyond uh, to where you had to be a white resident to even live there. And that uh, is perpetuated through today where uh, we have three of the whitest neighborhoods in the city, uh, the, the three whitest neighborhoods, excuse me, uh, in Ward 13. Uh, and when you look at historically what's here, access to green space, uh, the parks, the schools, the property values that then drive the quality of the schools, uh, Ward 13 has an advantage that other communities don't have. And we've uh, historically actively tried to remove marginalized populations from our area. Uh, even here in Linden Hills, there was a, a black preacher that was run out of town in the 1920s. Uh, I think we need to make reparative investments in the other parts of the city that haven't had the advantages that Ward 13's had historically. Thank you. Uh, and we'll turn to uh, climate change. And we'll go first to Mike Norton, then to Lene Pomisano, and, and then Ken Salve. How do you propose addressing climate change in your role with the city council? Sure. Well, I first yeah, you first. Um, yes. 
Uh, so I, I think that there's multiple areas where we can we can address climate change, but it has to be done at the front lines. Uh, you know, the reality is it's going to be difficult to get much done at a state level when you're dealing with uh, Republican-controlled Senate. Uh, and I think that we can be a leader in the area of climate change. Um, I've been an EV driver since 2014, uh, but I, I don't think that that's necessarily going to move the needle. Uh, really, we're talking about reducing trips. Uh, Denser neighborhoods, opportunity for fewer car rides or fewer car trips, excuse me. Um, I also think that the city has a unique opportunity and one that's uh, maybe been failed to be capitalized on by the neighborhood, by the mayor, excuse me, where we have a lot of leverage over the uh, municipality, or excuse me, the um, uh, utility companies as a municipality. We can be pushing Center Point, we can be pushing Excel Energy for greener, more renewable options, and, and doing more uh, for carbon emissions. Thank you. So one important um, relationship that we have as a local government unit is something called the Clean Energy Partnership Agreement. And um, we've used that to work with our energy partners on how we create a greener city, reduce our carbon emissions as a city. And that is coming up for renewal in this next term in office. I think it's important to be at the table and I think it's perhaps time for us to expand it beyond just the city of Minneapolis and start to think regionally. Um, one important measure that we took um, toward climate, doing better by way of climate, is our transportation action plan. Um, I want a transit system that serves the corners of our city and I'm excited that we're starting to have some of those investments being made. Um, we've made some definite improvements in zero waste in our city and we have to do more. And I'd say that's kind of the approach that I think we can take next year is as, as we are able to overcome these overlapping crises, I think our focus can change to be more focused on climate solutions. Thank you. Ken Shalloway. So waste is important. Um, reducing the waste uh, even more than what we already have and then also producing more solar more things that don't require so much or so much emissions into the ozone so in terms of city council what city council can do i, I don't know that it's you know she says expand outside minneapolis that, that's not a possibility i don't think for the city council you know we're here for the city of minneapolis yeah so it's just i feel like if we're going to put money and resources into that we can put money and resources into other things that are, that are really pressing homelessness for example um is more important to me than Providing houses for people who don't have is more important to me than the emissions that outside of Minneapolis, for example. But to answer the question, yes, reduction in waste and more more go, go green would help. Thank you. For the next question, we'll go right in order. Ken Solway, Mike Norton, Lene Palmasano. Some residents, this question was submitted by a ward resident. Some residents of Ward 13 feel that snow plowing for both streets and alleys has gotten dramatically worse over the past 10 years with some streets regularly not getting plowed after some snowfalls and snow boulders and ice left on streets for weeks at a time. What will you do to improve on this and bring Minneapolis back to the higher quality level of snow and ice removal we had 15 years ago? Well, 15. So obviously it's the easiest answer is going to be more money. It costs more money to have more snow plows, more people working, more people clearing the snow, melting the snow, throwing the ice down, all that. It costs more money. So in terms of programs, like I just stated before, Money needs to be, if there's a budget, they cut from certain things like that. They're going to cut from the snowplow as opposed to the the emissions we were just talking about. Um, it's important, though, it's going to have to be money. It's going to take more money. I mean, then, then you're talking, it's going to take money. That's how it's done. It's just more money to hire more people, higher quality, better products better machinery. I mean, it's, just, it's all about the money. It's what it comes down to. And unless they're willing to take it from another program and give it to that, I don't know if it's ever going to get back to where it was 15 years ago. Thank you. Mike Norton. Sure. Uh, I would support uh, more more resources for, for plowing. I think it's a public safety issue. Uh, you know, we, we have uh, kids that are needing to get to school, uh, people that are 
we continue to work. Uh, you know, I, I would actually expand it beyond uh, um, more resources for just plowing. I, I would uh, say that the city should be uh, in charge of, of shoveling our own sidewalks rather than putting that requirement on residents. And I think you have a number of instances where people either don't make the effort to shovel their sidewalk, uh, maybe don't have the ability to or need some help or need some resources to get it done. And um, it ends up being dangerous both on the streets and on the sidewalks for a period of a number of weeks or even months during the winter. So I would like to see the city expanding that and considering it more as a, a public safety component um, than a nuisance or, or a burden. Thank you. Elena Palmasano. I appreciate this question. I get a lot of these kinds of pieces of feedback um, during the winter time. Basic city services is something we absolutely need to deliver. We need to deliver it equitably all across our city. Um, some of the difficulty of snow plowing over the last 10 years, believe it or not, um, has been because of climate change. The kinds of deep freezes that end up having snow and ice adhere to our city streets. One of the things we've done to mitigate that is to do um, a, what's considered a climate-friendly pre-treatment of streets that essentially puts a brine down onto streets such that the snow does not um, stick so hard, I guess, to, to the roadway. We use significantly less salt per mile of street proportionally than, than I think anybody else in the metro area. That's really important for the health and cleanliness of our lakes. Uh, we need to do better at removing things from the roadways when there is a snow emergency. Um, and I think we need to use performance metrics. I think that some of my continued work on performance measures of our city can help us make sure we're doing this well. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, one more question about neighborhood. Okay. Um, this, this question will go first to Lene Pomisano, Ken Sawe, and Mike Norton. Uh, what do you see as a continuing role of the neighborhood associations? What can you do to maintain funding for them? What will you commit to do to support neighborhood organizations in the 13th Ward? Thank you. So. Um, I think I'm the only candidate running that was a part of my neighborhood association um, a number of years ago. I volunteered as a board member and um, ended up, I think, after that first meeting as one of the co-chairs. <laughs> um, I think that teaches you a lot about volunteers <laughs> when you end up a board officer after just one meeting. Uh, but I've learned a lot. Um, and I think neighborhood organizations are just a really important part of our community. Some of them, though not necessarily the ones down here, were developed because of our neighborhood revitalization program and continued stable funding for neighborhood organizations across our city really increase um, the sense of community that we have. Uh, it, it is also important to show up. Um, it's really important to show up at neighborhood organization meetings. It's a place that people find that they can come to, to meet with you, to ask questions. Um, it's given me an opportunity not only to get longer feedback, but also provide longer legislative updates and get feedback on my work at City Hall. Thank you. Ken Shalway. I've been very supportive of it. Um, funding for it uh, probably could use more. It's important, you know, if, when you think about a resident who moves to a certain area or to a, to a neighborhood, those are vital for them to, one, ask questions as she stated, you know, get to know other people in the in the neighborhood and just to learn about what it's about to live in the neighborhood, where you can find certain things or go to buy certain things. It's just, a, they're very important. They're, I'm a huge fan of them. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to sit on one yet, but I will um, in the future try to be on one of them, that's for sure, because they're so important. And, and the question was, how do you increase funding for it? Is that what it was? Uh, what can you do to maintain funding for them? I mean, there's got to be, to maintain the funding, I mean, you just got to have, um, to maintain the funding, it's just going to take donations. It's something I can think of right off the top of my head with the 15 second clock going off. Um, donations, raffles, things like that, just bringing more money to fund the neighborhood associations. 
because they, they are important. Thank you. Mike Norton. Uh, no, I, I agree with the sentiment uh, shared from the other two candidates. I, I think that neighborhood associations are critically important. I'm, I'm open to maybe like a meat raffle or something like that. But uh, <laughs> I, I think, uh, you know, the way to start is just to continue to fund through the normal mechanisms, through through City Hall and through uh, our, our budget. Um, you know, it's a, it's a unique opportunity to see, you know, granular points of view uh, in just pockets of our, our community. So I, I think it's critically important. Um, that I feel very fortunate to have multiple uh, community uh, neighborhood board members on, uh, or neighborhood association board members on our uh, campaign team, our council members on the Linden Hills Neighborhood, or excuse me, our campaign manager is on the Linden Hills Neighborhood Council, our communications manager is uh, on the Kenny Neighborhood Council. We have a number of people involved in neighborhood organizations involved in our campaign, and I'm a big supporter of neighborhood orgs. And by the way, thank you uh, for the neighborhood organizations for hosting us tonight. And that's a great mechanism of, of those organizations. Thank you. And this next question will have to be our last because we're running out of time. And it will go first to Mike Norton, then Ken Solway, and Lene Palmasano. If elected, what would you want your legacy to be? Uh, you know, it, the reason I'm running is, is because I'm frustrated with the pace of change, particularly around public safety. And, and I think police accountability, we're, we're in this historic moment, and I think we need to meet it. Um, this, is, uh, uh, this is an instance where the whole world is watching us, and we can take this chance or take this moment to, to lead and to do things differently and, and, and do things the way that we believe uh, that they should be. I, I think if we look at what got us here, look at the last 50 uh, plus years uh, of um, racist zoning policies uh, and perpetuation of those types of status quo environments that, that lead us to instability. And, and to me, I think we have an opportunity to, to have a change in direction uh, and, and reevaluate where we could be going as a city. Uh, to me, nothing is more important right now than public safety in Minneapolis. Thank you. I mean, in terms of legacy, I could care less about my legacy. I, I'm running to do better, to serve the community, to serve the city, and make it a better place, a more safer place. That's what I care about. I don't care about my legacy. I don't care about other things as well that have been mentioned. I, I care about making it better, safer for, I have a newborn child that I want to make sure when she grows up that she doesn't have to worry about the things I have to worry about today. So that's what I want my legacy to be. Thank you. Lene Palmasano. I want us to have a safer city than when I started um, in office and how we do that, how we achieve that, how we make everybody feel safe in, our, in their communities and every community is really complex. Um, I would like to know that my service will have made our government more participatory, right? When we can reduce barriers to participation, that's when we're having a better democracy. That's when we're making better decisions as a community and as, as a city. I want a vibrant and healthy city. Um, I want to have contributed to that. Um, and some of that is hard, but it involves decisions like what kinds of investments do we make in reconciliation and healing in our city? What kinds of investments do we make in rebuilding Lake Street? Because we need Lake Street and Lake Street needs us is the saying, and I believe that deeply. Um, how do we help invigorate the cultural corridors of our city? That's what I want to be on. Thank you. Thank you. And so now we'll turn to closing statements, and they will go in reverse order of when they started. So we will begin with Lene Palmasano. Thank you. Thank you for this time tonight. Thank you for hosting this forum. Um, let me reiterate that my progressive and pragmatic approach to governance is a both and model. Um, I think that what sets me apart from other candidates in this race is that I am tested, I am tested in government, and I am trusted in government, not just by people in the 13th Ward, but by people that I interact with every day across our city, by our city employees, by our regional partners, and by our state legislatures. Um, I've enjoyed the conversations and meeting people across our city and especially in my own in our own ward here in the 13th ward 
I've had an opportunity to have thousands of conversations this year to check in and, and just found um, people's vision and people's um, clear mindedness about where we go as a city um, is really inspiring. Um, I hope that I have earned the support of the people, the voters of the 13th Ward. I hope everybody gets out to vote. Um, I also might want to acknowledge that if there's something that the three of us might be in agreement here, um, knowing that you are both, we are all athletes at this table, it's that we're not the biggest event going on in our area tonight. The biggest event going on is the very important Southwest High School versus Washburn soccer game <laughs> that helps to the winner of which will go to the state championship, I understand. Um, that's where my family is tonight, and I am super eager to go and check the score of that as soon as this is done. So thank you. Thank you. Mike Norton. I, so I actually uh, got roped into uh, coaching my stepdaughter's uh, U15 soccer team during the campaign season uh, because there wasn't a coach to, uh, they, they sent out an email that was, hey, we're going to disband the team or we're going to spread you out over other teams unless you step up. So I'm sure she would share your uh, focus on, on the Southwest uh, uh, game tonight. And she hopes to play on Southwest when she's there next year for the next four years. Uh, it, it was mentioned um, that we need Lake Street uh, and that Lake Street needs us. Uh, my office is less than two blocks from Lake Street. And I remember some of the chaos last year and some of what was going on. Uh, and I think I would say my my lease was renewed this past summer, and um, I could I could have my business anywhere. We're, we're fortunate; we're ninety five percent of our revenue actually comes from outside the state of Minnesota. My office is in Minneapolis, and our company is based in Minneapolis because I love it here. And I think that it's important to recognize that we have a chance to lead here in Minneapolis. I, I look back to Sandy Hook and the feeling that we had around reasonable and sensible gun reform uh, as a society in the weeks and months after uh, that tragedy. And time went on and delay and inaction caused nothing to happen. And I worry that that's, that's what's gonna happen here um, with public safety reform and police accountability unless we recognize the importance of, of this moment and, this <coughs> action and, and meet the moment here at War 13. Thank you. Ken Sullivan. I think that the people of the 13th Ward have an opportunity to be the voice of reason at this election year. So I hope that everybody gets out and votes. Um, it's, it's time for Minneapolis to turn the page. You know, we, we've had a verdict come in in George Floyd. We, we, we've had the COVID. It's time for us to turn the page. It's not about, um, it's hard to turn the page and move forward if you have the same people in power that were there during the, the demise of the city. So it's important that we come together as a group and Vote for the people who have the best interest. And, and, and again, there's that accountability. You know, it's just, that's what it comes down to for me. That's why I decided to run. It's all about accountability. You can't have the same people in power. I don't think any incumbent should have ran after what has happened to the city over the past two years, to be honest with you. But it, it's up to the voters. And, and I hope that um, make the right decision uh, two weeks from now, right? So thank you. Thank you. Well, there's never enough time to answer all the questions. And our, to our viewers, if we didn't get to your question, I invite you to contact your candidates directly right after the forum. Um, the League and uh, sponsors, thank you for viewing this Ward 13 candidate forum. We would especially like to thank our candidates for being part of the democratic process by running for office and for participating in this forum. The League of Women Voters also researches issues important to our members and to the health of our community. If you are interested in finding out more about what we do and how you can make a difference, please go to the website lwvmpls.org there you can view our recent public safety study. Our website also has links to all the candidate forums and additional voter information, including the Minneapolis Municipal Election Voter Guide and questionnaires with the candidates' responses to issues important to the community. You can find still more information about candidates and about voting at 
mnvotes.org, the Secretary of State's website, and lwvmn.org. This concludes our forum for Ward 13. Thank you and remember to vote on or before November 2nd. Thank you. Yeah, thank you again. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, on the audience. Just <laughs> 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 yeah. Just like at the end of the news broadcast where they can't hear us, <laughs> but we're all still, or everyone's still here. Thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>